At the beginning of the 18th century, what is today the Trans-Mississippi United States consisted of three political regions, each controlled by a foreign power. By early in the 20th century, those areas were part of the United States and were broken into 22 political divisions, with borders being essentially as they are today. The changes that occurred over that time are fascinating and are the subject of our Shaping the American West series of YouTube lectures. Period maps provide a unique perspective on this topic, for they show us the political situation in the country in, as it were, real time, as the borders were drawn and redrawn, even when the borders lasted for just a short time. And as we'll see for the first time in this lecture, contemporary maps sometimes also show borders that were never officially created. In any case, these lectures will look at the shaping of the American West using original maps from the period to help illustrate this complex subject. As we saw in the first two lectures in this series, by 1848, the borders of the United States in North America were very close to today's borders. In the Trans-Mississippi West, the internal political divisions consisted of five smallish political units along the Mississippi River, one state, Texas, in the south, one large territory, Oregon, in the northwest, and the rest of the west consisting of large, unorganized territories. The next decade or so leading up to the Civil War saw the breaking up and official organization of the territories in the west. This breaking up of the large territories was driven by several factors. Beginning with the California Gold Rush, there was a large increase in immigration into and across these territories. The increased population in the West led to the need for smaller political divisions. From a government viewpoint, the large territories were difficult to control because of the distances involved and the differences of the needs of citizens in widely separated locations. For the citizens, they too wanted smaller units for easier access to the government and because a local government would be more sensitive to the needs of the population than one located far away. And also that way, citizens didn't have to worry about being outvoted by others who live far away with often quite different needs and desires. This third lecture in the Shaping of the American West series will look at the initial breaking up of the territories in the region. Which large territories were breaking up first tended to follow where there was the greatest increase in population. In the 1840s, much of the growth in the American West occurred in the lands just across the Mississippi River. And this included the Iowa Territory, which had been created in 1838. The population growth in Iowa was driven by its proximity to the states and also lead mining and new lands offering the possibility of farming for Anglo-Americans. The creation of states out of the territories generally followed the rules set down by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which stated that a new state could be established in a region when its population of voters, that is white male property owners, reached 60,000. By 1844, the southern part of Iowa Territory had over 75,000 such inhabitants, and these citizens wanted to seek statehood. As we noted in the last lecture, one of the longest running issues which reared its head any time a new territory or state was being considered by Congress was the equal balance between slave and free states. Neither Northerners nor Southerners would allow one or the other type of state to be created unless a balancing state was also admitted. Luckily for Iowans, Florida was looking to be admitted as a state at the same time, so Congress agreed to the creation of both states. Florida was admitted in 1845, but because of some issues over exactly what the borders of Iowa would be, it wasn't until 1846 that Iowa was admitted as a state. The rest of the original Iowa Territory, the lands to the north of the new state between the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, was left unorganized. Until 1849, when this area, along with a little bit of Wisconsin Territory east of the Mississippi, became the Minnesota Territory. At about the same time immigrants were moving into the Iowa Territory, more far-sighted immigrants were heading much further west, out to Oregon country. 
American settlers began to arrive there in the late 1830s along the Oregon Trail, culminating in the Great Migration of 1843. By the 1846 Oregon Treaty with Great Britain, the lands west of the Continental Divide between the 42nd and 49th parallels officially became part of the United States. This was initially unorganized territory, but two years later in 1848, it was officially established as the Oregon Territory. Some of the immigrants who had moved out to Oregon decided the settlements in the Willamette Valley were too crowded, so they headed north of the Columbia River. They felt that the Oregon territorial government was too far away and not concerned enough of their needs, so they petitioned Congress to create a new territory for them. As a result, in 1853, the Washington Territory was created from the northern half of the Oregon Territory. The border between the two territories followed the Columbia River until it turned sharply northward, at which point the border followed the 46th parallel. While these changes were being made in the northwestern part of the country, the southwest was also an area in need of rational organization. In 1848, by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo with Mexico, the United States gained a vast new region consisting of the Mexican provinces of New Mexico and Alta California. These lands, called the Mexican Cession, came into the country as unorganized territory. However, the increased immigration into the area, especially spurred by the discovery of gold in California in 1849, made it obvious that this territory had to be divided and politically organized. One result was that both California and New Mexico applied for statehood. These applications spurred a third application for the creation of the state of Deseret. In 1847, Bringing Young had led the Mormons out of Illinois to the Salt Lake Valley so they could practice their religion without interference. Young had an expansionist view for his people. Hoping to establish Mormon settlements throughout the huge region lying west of the Rockies and east of the Sierra Nevadas, from Oregon in the north to Mexico in the south. The Mormons came to call this region Deseret, which according to the Book of Mormon means honeybee. Young did not want to be left behind if California and New Mexico were made into state. So he petitioned for the establishment of the state of Deseret, encompassing the vast region between these proposed states. Many in the United States government were anti-Mormon, and Congress was reluctant to give the Mormons such a seat of power, and so Deseret was never recognized. Still, the Mormons set up a government and ran the area for a few years until, as we shall see, the Utah Territory was established in 1850. Even then, they didn't give up. Unsuccessfully petitioning the federal government to create the state of Deseret in 1856, in 1862, and in 1872. The map displayed here is a nice example of a map showing political borders which were never officially created. This was not that common, but it did happen a number of times in the 19th century. It took a fair amount of time for a map publisher to create a map, and the publishers didn't want to issue a map that was out of date as soon as it came out by, say, not including a new state or territory. Thus, if a publisher heard from his sources in Washington that there would be a new political border drawn, he would sometimes put it on the map even before it was confirmed. In this example, the publisher shows Deseret, even though it was never actually created. As it happens, Congress had its own agenda for this region, which did not favor Mormon control. This resulted in the Compromise of 1850, which had several components. First, the western part of Alta California, which was relatively well developed and populated, was brought in as the Free State of California. At the same time, Texas had its borders modified. Texas had claimed a huge swath of land extending west of the Rio Grande and with the famous chimney running all the way up to the 42nd parallel. In return for debt relief from the U.S. government, Texas accepted reduced borders, including a northern border at the 36 degree 30 minute line of latitude. As we saw in the last lecture, 
By the Missouri Compromise, no slavery was to be allowed in territories or states which extended north of this line of latitude. Texas had been, had been admitted as a slave state, and it accepted the 3630 as its northern border in order to retain this status. The rest of the Mexican session was divided into two large territories, New Mexico and Utah. One of the main issues of debate which Congress had to deal with in breaking up and organizing the Mexican session was slavery. In the previous lectures, we have seen how Southerners, in particular, were concerned to keep the number of slave states equal to the number of free states. In 1849, there were 30 U.S. states, half free soil and half slave. This balance, though, was thrown off by the admittance of California as a free state, with no offsetting slave state admitted at the same time. Southerners in Congress accepted this because as part of the Compromise of 1850, they were able to achieve a new principle which they believed would benefit the preservation and expansion of slavery. If you look at the map of the United States and how the 3630 line bisects it, it is clear that the majority of the not yet fully politically divided lands lie north of this line. You can also see how both the new territories of New Mexico and Utah extend north of that line and thus, in theory, should, not, should be prohibited from allowing slavery. However, so Southerners went along with the creation of these territories because they were created under the rule of popular sovereignty, which meant that their citizens could vote on whether or not they would be free or slave. This was a huge concession to the South and it was this which allowed for the passing of the Compromise of 1850. Now, this does seem to have gone against the Missouri Compromise. However, strictly speaking, the Missouri Compromise related only to lands part of the original Louisiana Purchase, and since both New Mexico and Utah are west of the Continental Divide, they were not part of the original Louisiana Purchase, and so, strictly speaking, were not subject to that compromise. As a result of the Compromise of 1850, the focus of efforts to break up and organize the lands of the West turned to the central part of the country. The Southwest had been dealt with, at least as a start. The Northwest was divided into two moderate-sized territories. The eastern edge of the Trans-Mississippi United States was broken into five moderate-sized states and territories. And the vast region in the middle, however, was still unorganized territory, supposedly set aside for Native Americans. It soon became obvious that having this vast region as unorganized Indian territory was a problem. While these lands had initially provided a buffer between the states and Spanish lands, they now were a barrier between the eastern and western parts of the country. Thousands of immigrants began to cross the section on their way west and there was clearly an economic and political need for a transcontinental railroad to connect the coast. This meant that in this region, there was a need for a military presence for protection, for formal government structures for laws, and new settlements to help secure the region for development. This all meant that it was imperative for the United States government that this region become politically organized. Between 1844 and 1854, there were eight proposals for the creation of a new territory spanning this unorganized region, usually following the Platte River and called either the Platte or the Nebraska Territory. The name Nebraska was taken from the auto name for the Platte River. All these attempts failed, mostly because this territory was north of the 3630 line and so would end up being broken into free states, and the Southerners in Congress didn't want to allow that to happen. Finally, a compromise was arrived at with Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. By this act, most of the Great Plains was divided into two new territories, Kansas running essentially west of the state of Missouri all the way to the Rockies, and Nebraska consisting of all the lands to the north of Kansas. Note that this meant that the Indian Territory was shrunk to quite a small area south of Kansas, essentially today's Oklahoma. The creation of these two new territories was accepted by the South because the new territories were brought in under the provision of popular sovereignty, used previously for Utah and New Mexico, allowing for the possibility of them becoming slave states. This was the point of having two new territories rather than one, 
the Southerners thought that Kansas, being directly west of the slave state of Missouri, would opt to be a slave state as well. Unlike the earlier use of popular sovereignty, though, this was in direct conflict with the Missouri Compromise, for these new territories were part of the original Louisiana Purchase, and both were north of the 3630 line. This inflamed the passions of the abolitionists and led to the formation of the Republican Party, as well as to the conflict in bloody Kansas. Ultimately, this is one of the primary causes of the outbreak of the Civil War six years later. The controversial passing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act brought the breaking up and organizing in the American West to an almost complete halt. This was despite the fact that the growth of population in the region created a large demand by Western citizens for the creation of new territories and states. Such action by Congress, though, was almost impossible, for Southerners were against any new free soil states or territories, and Northerners were against any new slave states or territories. And because of the reaction to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the notion of allowing further territories or states into the Union via popular sovereignty became a political impossibility. As a result, there were only two further border changes in the American West between 1854 and 1860. One was the 1858 creation out of the Minnesota Territory of a new state of Minnesota. Most of the settlement in the Minnesota Territory was along the Mississippi River, and so the new state was thus carved out of the eastern part of the territory. One of the interesting things about this new state, it is one of only two states, the other being Louisiana, that lie on both sides of the Mississippi River. With the creation of the new state, the western half of the old Minnesota Territory became the unorganized district of Dakota. The other border change after the Kansas-Nebraska Act was creation of a new territory in the Pacific Northwest. As we noted earlier, Washington Territory was created from the northern half of Oregon Territory in 1854. By the late 1850s, the western part of Oregon Territory had achieved sufficient population that statehood was applied for. So, in 1859, the western half of Oregon Territory was granted statehood, with the eastern part of its territory added to the western territory, creating this inverted L shape. So, to summarize, we have seen how the increased settlement and development of the American West led to demands for breaking up and organizing what were at mid-century huge and unwieldy territories. There was some progress on this front, especially with the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1856. However, both of these were controversial and tensions over slavery led to an almost complete stop in the political development of the West after 1854 despite the continuing immigration there and the resulting need for progress on that front. In the next lecture, we will see how these tensions resolved themselves beginning in 1861. Thank you for viewing this lecture about the changing American West in the antebellum years. We hope you found it enjoyable and informative. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch. If you would like to see a selection of original antique maps, please visit our website at pps-west.com.